Hello everyone! Today we're talking about our favorite subject, dinosaurs. But we're adding a twist. We're going to talk about dinosaurs and Noah's Ark. So let's jump right in. <laughs> First, a note. This is my 100th video. Yay! Okay, let's get to the material. We've all heard the Noachian Flood legend. I say legend because it was likely based on an aggrandized earlier story by a different culture. In this story, Noah had to get a pair of every terrestrial animal, as well as presumably protists, bacteria, archaeans, algae, and plant seeds. But modern creationists say that Noah only got one pair of each clean kind of animal and seven of each unclean kind. Don't ask for too many details on how the Bible defines either. What a kind is, is up to you anyway. As I've pointed out elsewhere, creationists certainly don't know. Regardless, creationists figure Noah needed just one archetypal representative of each dinosaur kind on the ark. Once the dinosaurs got off the ark, they apparently underwent the world's most rapid speciation events where, according to Answers in Genesis, 50 kind archetypes diversified into thousands of terrestrial species that almost immediately went extinct. Wait a minute, you exclaim. How did Noah get the archetypes on the ark? Did he or other people travel around the world to get them? Well, the answer is, who knows? The Bible doesn't mention North or South America, Western Europe, Eastern Asia, Australia, or Antarctica, likely because its authors were ignorant of those places. Presumably, God just neglected to tell his chosen people about their existence. Well, the Nephites and Lamanites knew about North America, but that's another story. So either God told all the dinosaur archetypes to go to the Middle East, or Noah and his family went out to collect them. It's up to you which is more plausible. But, you object again, how would Noah get the giant dinosaurs on board? Yeah. Ken Ham strokes the beard hanging from his synapsid-derived jaw. We don't need two grown-ups of every species of giant dinosaur. All we need is a small representative of each kind on the ark. So, instead of having two adult Argentinosaurus, Noah could have simply taken the much smaller Titanosaur, Magyarosaurus. Easy, right? Well, this is where AIG starts getting into trouble. AIG singer and paleo artist Buddy Davis wrote an article in 2010 titled Dinosaurs on the Ark, where he says, quote, For instance, there are many different long-necked sauropods, such as Brachiosaurus, Camarasaurus, Saltosaurus, and Diplodocus. But only two needed to go onto the Ark if they were just one kind. Close quote. So, all the aforementioned sauropods are one kind? Okay, then a kind in this case is larger than a superfamily, since Diplodocus is in the superfamily Diplodocoidea, while the other three are in the unranked clade Macronaria. The anatomical differences between just a Diplodocus and a Brachiosaurus are certainly comparable to that distinguishing humans from Australopithecines, which most creationists don't include as the same kind. Since these two clades make up most of the larger clade, Neosauropoda, how large is a kind? The same line of thinking could apply to Tyrannosaurids. Why get Tyrannosaurus rex on the Ark when you could get the much smaller Tyrannosauroid, Guanlong? But why stop there? Why not get Compsognathus and have all Coelurosaurs speciate from there? That way you'd need even fewer archetypes on the Ark. But wait, are Coelurosaurs related to all Allosauroids? Are all Avitheropods related to Megalosauroids? Are all Titanurans related to Ceratosaurs? Are all Avarostrans related to Dilophosaurs, Coelophysoids, Eoraptor, and Herrerasaurs? Uh-oh. Could we just get one representative theropod for the Ark? As we saw in the video, the source methods approach, even using creationist methods of classification, show that all these dinosaurs are related. You're just cherry-picking large dinosaurs for the Ark, creationists cry. They continue, most dinosaurs were about the size of a sheep. Now, we investigated this claim before in my video, The Scientific Method. 
There, we looked at the creationist article determining average dinosaur size using the most recent comprehensive body mass data set. What we found was that the creationist said the median, not average, dinosaur size was that of a bull, not a sheep. Even though the creationists ignored a wealth of data on dinosaur size, namely from birds, to reach their conclusion, this isn't even the most egregious thing they said. That would be where they came up with the claim that the average dinosaur size was that of a sheep. The earliest occurrence of this claim that I can find is in the 2006 AIG's The New Answers book in a chapter written by Ken Ham titled, What Really Happened to the Dinosaurs? Ham goes through numerous lines of blatant falsities regarding dinosaurs, but on page 166, he lays out his evidence for his sheep-sized dinosaurs claim. Quote, but the average size of a dinosaur, based on skeletons found over the earth, is about the size of a sheep. Close quote. What evidence does he provide, you ask? Two sources. Jack Horner and Don Lessim's book, The Complete T-Rex, and Michael Crichton's sci-fi novel, The Lost World, which is, yes, the sequel to Jurassic Park. For the first source, it's a secondary source, not a technical paper. But for the second, it's fiction. Maybe the worst part is that the Crichton source wasn't taken out for the 2015 paper. That is, they thought it was credible enough to keep. But there are other problems with trying to determine the average dinosaur size. These can be boiled down to problems of arbitrariness, uncertainty, and irrelevance. For arbitrariness, there's a problem of weighting the averages. If we are looking at the average size from the family level, which, remember, is claimed to be about the same as a kind, unless it's not, then would a monotypic family containing only one taxon carry the same weight as a family with 20 species? Next, for uncertainty, paleontologists are aware of some dinosaur ghost lineages, such as that of early Averostrans and Pachycephalosaurs. Ghost lineages are places where we are missing fossils for some lineage. So how would those lineages affect the average size calculations? Last, for irrelevance, what does knowing the average dinosaur size tell us about the evolutionary history of dinosaurs? Basically nothing. If you average the sizes of Supersaurus and Epidexipteryx, then what does that tell you about dinosaurs as a whole? Dinosaurs are an incredibly diverse group from around the world hailing from numerous environments spanning 150 million years and having highly varied anatomy, physiology, and behavior. These factors contribute to why no one is, or has, outside of AIG, attempted to calculate the average dinosaur size. Now for the last part of this video, is there any evidence that dinosaurs lived with humans? The only dinosaurs that live with humans are avian ones since all the non-avian dinosaurs died out around 65 million years ago, as did most of the Cretaceous bird bunch too, if we're getting finicky. However, cryptozoologists claim that some dinosaurs are still alive, such as Mokele Mbembe, the supposed sauropod from Congo. Thus far, the only evidence of Mokele Mbembe is some anecdotal tales, but that hasn't stopped scores of people from looking for it. What about in the past? AIG maintains that dragon legends are based on human interactions with dinosaurs. Why? Well, some dinosaurs are large reptiles and dragons are large reptilian creatures, therefore they're the same. But dragons vary greatly from one culture to the next, with eastern dragons being more snake-like, and western dragons are more like your typical four-legged winged monster. By the way, a dragon with four legs and wings is a hexapod, not a tetrapod, meaning they grew two extra limbs. Even Anthrogenesis realized that was a problem anatomically. Anyway, why do dragons have to be based on dinosaurs? Why not snakes, alligators, Komodo dragons, iguanas, and other squamates? The only reason AIG thinks dragons are dinosaurs is to justify their belief in the coexistence of humans and dinosaurs. And that's largely because kids know all too much about dinosaurs, so creationists are driven to find some way to include them in the ARC booking list. This is something of a creationist last ditch effort to claim dinosaurs live with humans, since there are no fossils of humans with non-avian dinosaurs. The Paluxy River human tracks never held up to scrutiny, though not a few fringe creationists, including Kent Hoven, keep pushing them to this day. 
the Ica stones are a scam, and the Cambodian stegosaurus relief could be anything from a rhinoceros to a domestic boar. All in all, not one facet of creationism with regard to dinosaurs, or creationism in general, holds up to examination. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.